Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's panel, How to Deter Russia Now. My name is Emily Channel Justice. I'm the director of the Temerte Contemporary Ukraine Program at Harvard University's Ukrainian Research Institute. And I'm really delighted to be a co-sponsor of today's event with the Atlantic Council. As we know, we, we really can't do any more speculation about what Putin's next move will be. So the essential conversation now really has to be, how do we stop Russia from invading Ukraine again? Today's event will be focused on this with a really rich panel. We'll start today's event with a keynote lecture from philosopher, filmmaker, and author Bernard Henri Lévy. Then we'll move to a moderated discussion, which includes retired General Philip Breedlove, the former Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, Heather Conley, Senior Vice President, Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic for the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Ambassador John Herbst, the Senior Director of the Eurasia Center Atlantic Council, Ambassador Alexander Verschpaus, Distinguished Fellow at the Atlantic Council, and Andriy Zagorodnyuk, Chair for the Center for Defense Strategies. And this discussion will be moderated by Melinda Herring. Let me turn the floor over to Bernard Levy now. Thank you. Hello. Thanks, everyone. How to deter Putin? I will leave the reply to the distinguished speaker who will speak after me. What I would, what I, what I, um, what I'm able to say first of all is that I was there on the ground and on the battlefield a few months ago. I went my way all through from Mariupol to Luhansk and Donetsk, the 450 kilometers. What I witnessed a few months ago is a situation of war, of uh, half cold and half warm war, which is nearly unthinkable from Europe and probably from America. Here, on this road, in Pitsky, in um, so many ghost cities, you have a sort of frozen Verdun with a, a whole a network of trenches which is real war at the border of the West. This is a thing which, to which we are blind too often in the West, but which is a sad and a terrible reality. I'll film that. I did film it. I have a lot of uh, footage from that. Uh, it has been um, uh, put, implemented in my last movie. All these images are available. Number two, in the last hours, days and even hours, I received countless messages from the spot, from comrades of the tens Assault Battalion of Montaigne, for example. In the spot, there, there is a feeling of a vigil of arms, which is, again, nearly unthinkable, but which is the reality which we have to think. My friends who are on the ground feel the war, and they feel it not as a possibility which can occur, in a more or less remote future, they feel it as a reality which could be, which is, which could happen to be true in the very, very, very next future. I spoke with a one friend uh, a few hours ago who told me about a rumor which is spreading in the trenches in Donbass, saying that something could happen very close. Um, for the, in a way, in a tragic way, celebrating the anniversary of the collapse of Soviet Union. Uh, Vladimir Putin being fond of these sort of dark and tragic anniversaries. So we are, this is the situation we are, we, are we are facing. We have the moral duty to deter Russia in emergency. Why do we have this duty? Because the Ukrainians are our allies, because they have been since 2014 our rampart against the aggressivity and the imperialism of a new Russia, or old Russia, as you prefer. There is a, um, an old Eurasian dr dream of Putin, which is uh, an alternative uh, dream from the Euro uh, European one, uh, and Ukraine is in the middle of that. It is the first target. 
So a country which is our ally, which is our rampart, who already spread and spilled so much blood for the values of Europe and the values of the West, we have the moral duty to be at uh, his side. I would like to add that we have maybe more important than the moral duty, the political duty to do so, political duty. Because if in the next weeks or days or hours, the Russian army happened to invade Donbas under the pretext that Donbas have been in the remote past part of Russia, under the pretext that every place in the area where you have Russian speakers belong to Russia, it is the real Pandora box, which will be opened for all Europe. Thereafter, there will be claims in Spain by the Catalans, in Romania by the Transylvans. What about Belgium? What about Switzerland? Not to speak uh, uh, about, uh, I don't know, even parts of America where you speak of United States, where you speak Spanish and so on. If the West accepts, puts the tip of the finger in this narrative of Putin, in this so-called common sense, which says that where you speak Russian, Russia is, it is a terrible precedent for all the organized uh, world. So we have not only the moral duty, we have political duty to do so. And I will want to say uh, last word that uh, um, if you see the situation from Ukraine, and again, I, I am receiving in the last hour so many calls from good friends from there, there is a, a real anxiety about the American reply. Ukraine, Ukraine received a lot of good words from America and from Europe. Um, the, the, the new Minister of Foreign Affairs of Germany, President Biden, President Macron expressed some strong words. But what are the acts for the moment? What are the concrete propositions of deterrence? What is the calendar, except let's meet with, with Mr. Putin in January. America and the West in general lost so much of their credibility in recent years and months on other front lines, in Afghanistan, in Kurdistan, elsewhere. What will happen in Ukraine? Will there is their credibility intact in this diplomatic game? Do they have the means to be heard and believed and taken seriously? I pray for that. Because if Putin happened to invade Luhansk, Donetsk, Pitsky, Shirokide, all these cities in Ukraine, it will be a very, very dirty war. This is what I foresaw when I was there a few months ago. So I cross my fingers, I pray, and I beg my administration and the American administration to take the real dimension of the tragedy which is now cooking. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Bernard, for those profound remarks and for that warning. We're, we're so delighted that you were here with us. Thank you for your leadership on Ukraine and around the world. Now it's my pleasure. And Bernard, we can't wait to host you at the Atlantic Council in person in January. So we'll look forward to seeing with, uh, you then. And in the meantime, you're absolutely right to keep praying for peace in Ukraine. Now, we have a fantastic panel today and we don't have a much time. So I'm gonna ask them to please give short, succinct answers. Give me TV answers. And I'm gonna dive in first with General Breedlove. General Breedlove, some analysts think that Vladimir Putin will go all the way and invade Ukraine. Others disagree. 
Almost everyone thinks, though, that Putin hasn't made his mind up yet. Can you help us, sir? How will he decide? Can you guide us through Putin's decision making now? Well, first of all, anybody that tells you know what they know what Putin is thinking, I would take them with a grain of salt. So let me just make some observations based on what we see. Uh, we got, we have to remember first this this crisis is completely contrived. It is manufactured by Putin for a purpose. And now what's important is what is that purpose? What is he trying to get from us? And that has sort of manifested itself over the last couple of days. And we need to keep our eyes on the thought of protecting against the fall of Zelensky and, and protecting against the United States taking actions that might be inappropriate vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, vis-a-vis -vis NATO, et cetera, that we stay on our turf and work with our allies rather than speak for our allies. I think Mr. Putin's made a huge investment, and that brings uh, a need for recouping from that investment. He's going to want to get the demands that he has made. And I believe that he will continue to use this, this moment that he has manufactured and the power on the ground until he gets those. I do believe he's taking a look though at the cost. And finally, I would just say, again, we have to be careful not to reward bad behavior. Uh, we, we need to avoid playing this game with Ukrainian chips or NATO chips. We need to stay in our lane and not sell out our allies and bring along our allies and others and involve them in the things we do. We have to focus on concurrent progress on Mints and Normandy and get a seat at the table, in my humble opinion. And finally, we need to remember that the rest of the world is watching for the results of this bad behavior. Thank you so much, General. Appreciate that. Andrew, you are uh, the former Minister of Defense of Ukraine and in Kiev, so it's great to have your perspective. Uh, if Putin invades, what would he likely take and what's his end game? I think a lot of us here are trying to figure that out. Could you please uh, run through the most likely scenarios? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Melinda, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, first of all, uh, I think that uh, Deconstructing all behaviors, deconstructing all scenarios, and uh, we, we're doing this pretty much, you know, 24/7 here. Uh, I don't think he, uh, they actually plan uh, that this the likely scenario would be actually invasion. I think they want the uh, West to think that they are the invasion is imminent. I think they want the West to be scared. I think they uh, want the West to to say, okay, we need to do anything to avoid invasion. And at the end, they want West to make concessions, and then uh, with a great sort of, um, you know, gesture, they they will agree not to invade. And uh, as uh, some analysts, including in US, said, uh, Institute of War Studies, for example, they said that if Putin didn't want to invade from the first place, then he will get all concessions, pretty much giving up nothing. Uh, and that's, I think, the most likely scenario, and I think that's that's the plan A for them. Uh, because plans A, B, C, whatever else looks quite bad for Putin, to be honest. Because what, what, what I mean, he will have a huge resistance in Ukraine. The Ukrainian armed forces are ready to uh, apply all their um, capabilities. Obviously, they have huge gaps of capabilities. We know about that. And obviously, uh, the, the Russia will be able to advance quite significantly in the case of they talking about the full scale invasion. But recent polls, which we kind of suspected, but we did recent like statistics polls and, uh, and, and, and so on, are showing that a huge number of Ukrainians want to uh, and are ready to defend, participate in either territorial defense or resistance and so on. A very, very small fraction of Ukrainians want to live or e even like are happy to live under Russian rule. So, which means that he will, uh, even if he gets some territories, it would be very difficult to imagine how they're going to hold them and how they're going to run an effective occupational administration. Uh, they don't have, we know that they're spending about two to two to four billion US dollars a year to support uh, uh, basically non existent economies of uh, so called LNR, DNR. Uh, but uh, it just it's, it's unimaginable if you can extrapolate that to the territory of Ukraine. Uh, uh, occupying one or two cities will do, do not give them any um, doesn't give him any any uh, strategic uh, advantages. But it uh, starts all the sanctions and all kind of a resistance and everything. So essentially, there is no point for them to 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 have a small local kind of a wars. The only the only 
way it would matter if they start a full-scale invasion of the whole country or at least half of it, like let's say left left bank and Odessa area and that, that sort of thing. But then we're talking about a major war in Europe, probably the biggest since the World War II. And in this case, we'll have a substantial economic crisis for the whole Europe. We'll have millions of refugees. We'll have a, a lot of lost investments and so on. So how your Russian economy will be able to withstand that sort of pressure from the world uh, for starting that, it's very difficult to imagine. But certainly, uh, Ukrainians can promise Russians to re- to return back many body bags and many wounded soldiers. And we're talking about thousands, uh, probably in a very short period of time, thousands and thousands. That's not going to be politically uh, welcome in Russia because the Russians very I will find it very difficult to explain why what they're actually doing in Ukraine. So generally speaking, uh, we have about fifteen or sixteen scenarios of what they can do without a full invasion, which will get us to get the West really be scared, Ukraine really be stressed. The world will be talking about the potential invasion. So like information uh, wise and stress wise, that would be all got to the very limit. And I I think they will apply all possible tools in order to um, reach the concessions through those means rather than uh, uh, rather than face a an absolutely uncontrolled scenario, uh, which would be for him the, uh, the actually the attempt to invade Ukraine. Thanks, Andrew. I, I definitely want to Thank pull you. on some of those threads in a minute, especially on the insurgency yeah. thread. But I, I want to br- I want to yeah. bring Heather into the conversation now. Heather, can you please um, help us? How can the West get Putin to leave without appeasing him? I think that's the big question. Thanks, Belinda. Uh, you know, uh, I don't believe we can. Uh, and, and in some ways, um, it, the Kremlin understands that this is an escalate to accommodate strategy. And, and the West has, has certainly followed that approach, uh, trying to dialogue our way through this. I do not believe uh, Mr. Putin will be satisfied by any of this. And I, I agreed with Andre uh, and, and how he cast this. Uh, the cost will be great for the Kremlin until the Kremlin actually published the text of the security treaties for the U.S. and, and for NATO. And what uh, President Putin just said yesterday, there is no going back. And so I think it now is starting to cut off even uh, Russia, uh, you know, trying to take a step back. And, and tragically, the Biden administration has now agreed to talks once again without requiring Russia to pull away from the border. At least that occurred in June uh, when President Biden met with President Putin. President Biden was asked on the margins of the Geneva summit and somewhat testy response, would his policy of seeking a stable and predictable Russia, would that work? And he said, we'll know in six months. We now know in six months. And and what this tragic pattern has occurred is the Russians escalate, they get a summit, they get big dialogues, nothing changes. So they will see how long they can accommodate. But the problem is they now have set a bar so high so publicly. My fear is they have talked, Putin is trying to restore this historic um, loss as he's told us in June um, at the 30th anniversary of the collapse of the Soviet Union. He's already strategically lost Ukraine in 2014, and he lost it again spiritually in 2019 with the autocephaly. So this is his attempt to restore this, uh, and uh, this will be the defining foreign policy issue for the Biden administration, and I hope they understand uh, the stakes here are absolutely enormous. Thank you, Heather. Sandy, same question. How can the West get Putin to leave without appeasing him? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I agree we're, we're very close to what may be a point of no return for Putin. And I think, you know, I agree that the publication of those two uh, draft treaties uh, basically uh, removed most of Putin's maneuvering room. By making those public, he's kind of making it almost impossible uh, for us to find some kind of way to, to de-escalate on, on, a, on a fair basis that would mean he would pull back his, his forces. And I think we were seeing that he's, he's quite serious in his paranoia about NATO. Uh, he does see NATO as uh, sort of the number one bogeyman that uh, you know, is the instrument that the main enemy, the United States, is using to uh, both undermine the Putin regime at home and deprive Russia of its great power status, which for Putin means uh, a sphere of influence and a free hand to dominate its neighbors. So uh, 
I, I judge by Putin's statement uh, yesterday at the Ministry of Defense that he really believes that if he doesn't act now, he will uh, lose Ukraine forever. Uh, and of course, underlying this is Putin's fear his, and his recognition that if Ukraine does succeed in becoming a stable, prosperous Western democracy, it will ultimately be a dagger pointed at the heart of Russia. The power of its example will sooner or later undermine the whole Putin regime. So for Putin, the stakes are survival. And that's why uh, he, he himself said there's no retreat anymore. Uh, even though this is a manufactured crisis, as General Breedlove pointed out. So, uh, you know, we have to continue to try, even uh, as we are pessimistic about where this is going, uh, to, to strengthen deterrence. I think the Biden administration has sent a lot of mixed signals. You know, Nord Stream 2 has been uh, hopeless in how we've handled that, even if it, even though uh, it's our main leverage or one of, one of the main point, points of leverage. And uh, if we agree to talks without any pullback of the troops, it also will be another signal of weakness to the Russians uh, that uh, uh, you know, they've got us where they want us. Uh, that would be a tragic misreading. I think that uh, there is greater unity now among allies. Uh, ironically, Putin is very successful in bringing NATO together, as he did in 2014. He may do it again. Uh, you know, it's hard to believe, but 20, 25 years late after the NATO-Russia founding act, we're still observing the commitments that we made not to deploy nuclear weapons or substantial combat forces along Russia's borders. Well, that's going to be all bets are off for that. Putin's going to create a much more threatening environment for himself if he goes through with this. And that's why you know, there may still be a, a small chance of convincing him to pull back. Uh, but we have to play our cards much more skillfully than we've been doing. Not, le not take anything off the table, including the use of force. Uh, it was good that somebody leaked to David Ignatius the possibility of supporting an insurgency. Uh, being ready to put a little, at least some skin in the game, not necessarily uh, going to war on behalf of Ukraine, but some skin in the game may make the difference in uh, convincing Putin uh, to, to, to rely on posturing and not actually use force. Great point, Sadie. Let me ask you one follow-up. You mentioned President Putin's statement yesterday. What do you make of the defense minister, the Russian defense minister's statement that there's an American military, private American military companies in the Donbass, and, and they're uh, thinking about a chemical weapons attack? What, what, what does that mean? Well, as far as I can tell, that's a total fabrication. But it's typical of what you could expect the Russians to do uh, to justify an invasion and blame it on NATO, blame it on the Ukrainians, I mean, they're using every uh, argument that they can muster. They're, they've used the old broken promise about NATO enlargement supposedly made to Gorbachev, which, by the way, somebody raised this in the Q&A. Uh, Gorbachev himself refuted this several years ago, and I'll put the reference in the, in the chat after I finish speaking. Uh, but uh, fabricating the, the idea that the U.S. is about to put hypersonic missiles or Tomahawk missiles uh, in Ukraine, uh, when NATO was announced that it's not putting new missiles anywhere, even in response to the Russian violation of the INF Treaty. That's something that also should be revisited. Uh, but uh, he will cook up whatever myths and fabrications he needs to convince his own people that it's not Russia's fault. Uh, but I don't think uh, this is going to be very convincing to the international community. Thanks, Sandy. Ambassador Herbst, you've praised the Biden administration for handling the, the crisis capably. However, since the Biden-Putin video call on the 7th, Putin has not de-escalated. His demands um, on NATO have only grown. And it looks like he got a meeting with the United States without de-escalating. Is Biden blowing it? How would you assess the U.S. so far, the response? I, I praise the initial response uh, when we during the press conference um, Tony Blinken had with Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kuleba in the middle of November, where we laid out the three things we would do if Moscow um, invaded, meaning major, major sanctions, uh, military arms to Ukraine, and pre putting out more NATO forces in the Eastern Allies, uh, in other words, in the Baltic States and Poland, to demonstrate to Moscow that any strategic gains they think they got in Ukraine, they're going to lose elsewhere. Unfortunately, though, um, we've seen alongside that initial strong response, um, wavering and weakness in dealing with Kremlin provocations. 
Uh, but I, I need to talk first about cyber to explain this. Uh, the, the Kremlin has been provoking us on cyber since May without any response from the administration besides words. Biden laid down clear red lines in Geneva, which Putin broke in early July. Biden laid down those clear red lines again in phone calls to Putin in July, and Putin broke those in September and October. At the same time, we were looking like patsies working with Russia on a joint resolution introduced at the UN on cyber. And worst of all, the administration released a major Russian cyber criminal to Russia, whom we spent years extraditing. Putin learned in cyber that he could push Biden around with impunity. And this may explain the difference between the crisis on Ukraine's border in, in the spring and the crisis on Ukraine's border now. In the spring, we effectively, but we effectively pushed um, Putin back. Today, we have not. And this comes back to now what's been happening since that strong response in November. Uh, right after the strong response, we began to talk about a virtual summit, which again was, as Heather pointed out, a gift to Putin. We have the summit, and what happens? Uh, we have continuing Russian provocations. The United States is talking about, let's have talks, and Russia is talking about steps that pave the way to war. This was especially noticeable yesterday when you had the Russian defense minister talking about this crazy provocation of U.S. introducing chemical weapons into eastern Ukraine, and you have Tony Bleaking about it, talking about how we're going to talk to Russia in January. It's like the bear versus the deer, and we know who wins in that scenario. So we have conveyed weakness um, fairly regularly, especially on cyber, but also on, on um, Ukraine. Now, I need to make one more point. I'm sorry if I'm going on a little bit too long. Um, I don't think we've reached or even approached quite the point of no return. I don't have any doubt that Putin can turn his policy around on a dime um, if he feels the need to. I agree uh, with Andre and to a certain extent with Heather that Putin is playing for the concessions he will get from us by threatening. And I don't have any doubt that there will be many places in Europe that will you know, uh, issue a sigh of relief. If Putin only, for example, grabs Mariupol, or if Putin only moves his troops halfway from the Russian border towards Kharkiv and say, well, look, there's no, no war, let's not put any sanctions down. And Moscow could play, play for that. And sadly, I think there may also be some people in Washington who will have a similar reaction. Uh, the game is show strength. We are far stronger than Russia in any category of national power. And while Russia can march into Ukraine with impunity. It will take hits that Andrew described militarily. If Biden keeps his promises on sanctions, they'll take major economic hits, and Putin understands that. We have a position of strength. If we make concessions, we've made concessions, and it's been to our costs so far. Um, it's still not too late, though, to make a very strong stand now. But we have to stop this talking about having talks while Moscow is threatening war. Thanks a lot, John. Heather, on, on John's point on sanctions, can you help us a little bit? Because there, there's uh, some confusing signals. So two weeks ago, it looked like the Biden administration had been doing all kinds of shuttle diplomacy and putting together a really strong package on sanctions. It looked like Berlin and Paris were two thumbs up. Last week, Bloomberg reported that Paris and Berlin were not two thumbs up and that they wanted to talk rather than, than think about sanctions. Are, are they going wobbly? What's, what's the latest? And if there was a change, why? Well, I, I think on the one hand, uh, the Biden administration does need to be commended. Um, there was a lot of consultation and, and the European Council meeting last week produced a very strong statement. Uh, NATO uh, has produced very strong statements. So I think they are very conscientious and conscious that this, this message of uh, strength and unity on sanctions. But you're absolutely right. Beyond those rhetorical statements, when the rubber meets the sanctions road, that's where we're going to have problems. For the 27 European Union members, uh, additional sanctions against Russia requires unanimity, and, and that's going to be challenging. Uh, let's also be clear, the type of devastating sanctions that we are talking about will have an equally devastating impact on the European economy 
at a time when energy prices are very high, exacerbated by Russia squeezing and limiting energy supplies through the Yamal pipeline. That is, again, an added tactic of pressure, as well as, as high inflation. Um, and, and it is exactly as uh, Ambassador Herbst mentioned. I mean, Europe takes its cues in many respects from Washington. So when Washington starts uh, focusing on the dialogue, and let me be clear, dialogue is important, particularly when tensions are high. We have to keep channels of communication open to Moscow. But when it seems like dialogue is uh, in some ways the path towards concession or accommodation, that's where um, you then started to hear as the Biden administration was focusing on uh, the bilateral, the U.S.-Russia talks, and then the NATO-Russia Council, OSCE. Then you had President Macron and now uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz uh, in Germany speaking to Putin, talking about this dialogue. Uh, no one wants to sacrifice their economy uh, and, and during these very challenging pandemic days. However, um, our principles are going to require transatlantic sacrifice, uh, not only strong military deterrence and support for Ukraine, but if we hold these values, we are going to have to do this. And I am concerned um, that uh, Europe rhetorically is saying the right thing, but this is going to be exceptionally difficult for all 27 countries to, to really do very painful, painful steps. So let's hope we don't have to do that. But uh, I think you're seeing the wobbliness because they're, they're not exactly sure where the U.S. is going to come out in this. Thanks, Heather. That, that, that's, that's great insight. If you're just joining us, we have five phenomenal experts and we are discussing how to deter Russia now. We'd love your questions. If you're in Zoom with us, go ahead and put those in the Q&A. If you're on Twitter, you can send them to us. I will read your question uh, and get a response. I will direct it to the right person. General Breedlove, I'm looking at you now. So the Biden administration is talking about arming Ukrainian insurgents. Will that strategy work? Is well, that a good idea? Uh, certainly, as several of our uh, panelists have discussed, we can uh, help the Ukrainians to increase the cost of taking reckless action in Ukraine. And I believe that's important. That uh, We saw that working against them when, they, when Russia went into the Donbass and the mothers of Russia revolting on what was happening. So I think that uh, uh, insurgents would be a good thing. Uh, a lot of words have been used about what that would look like. I like to use an umbrella word called resistance. And actually, the Baltic nations have wonderful programs of resistance. And this is a place that the NATO may be able to actually reach across the fence and help the Ukrainians. I'm sure they know how to do it in their country. But the fact of uh, organizing a resistance and all of the insurgents' words and, and uh, um, others that have been used can get rolled up in that. Thanks a lot, sir. Do you have any other advice that you would give to the Ukrainians right now? It, uh, we, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, um, you know, over the past four or five years, we've seen them build a very capable army. And um, it's, it has acquitted itself well in the field. But the fact of the matter is they are not prepared to defend themselves in the air nor on the sea. And all you have to do is think back to the highway of death out of Kuwait or, frankly, just to the last battles in Debaltseva about what happens when you lose air superiority over your troops. And so we can't let this army face that again. We, they need to be asking us and we need to be thinking about how do we better organize their air defense. And the same could be said about counter defense, coastal defenses and other things to give them some sea control. Um, and as you saw just recently in the last several days, we've sent some cyber teams there to help them because this, this gray zone attack that is going on now not waiting for it, the gray zone attack that has only intensified across the last several weeks inside of, of Ukraine needs to be addressed. And there are places that we could help in these gray zone areas, our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. Thank you so much. Really important points. Andrew, I'd like to ask you, uh, your foreign minister, Dmitry Kaleba, wrote in Foreign Affairs that Ukraine needs air and missile defenses now. He also said that ammunition and medical equipment are helpful. Does sending these weapons deter Putin or, or merely provide Putin with another pretext for invasion? No, I think it's uh, any, any assistance from the West uh, clearly helps to deter. 
and that's what we need. The last thing we need is to uh, operate with the um, with the uh, narratives that let's not uh, let's not poke Putin, you know, because that's that's clearly what reinforces his uh, behavior. We need to understand that the West, jointly with Ukraine, are capable to stop uh, stop him. He depends on the world economy. He's not an isolated country which exists, you know, in a, a self-sufficient. So they 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 depend on the inflow of the, uh, you know, of the money from the West. They they operate from in a global um, economic um, you know community and so on and so on. So turning off his uh, his economic capabilities and turning off his ability to to be a, a member of the international finance system and so on that that certainly helps. And then increasing, as just discussed, increasing the cost of uh, of the invasion up to the point that his advisors, who are still lots of them thinking reasonably, they would be understanding that uh, it would be a disastrous uh, adventure to get there, which potentially can destroy their regime inside, back inside Russia. Because, because as soon as they're going to lose thousands of people a day, as soon as they will be able to, uh, not being able to hold any occupied territories, as soon as they will be losing planes, helicopters, and so on. Uh, and the West and the United States particularly can help us to uh, to reach that. Uh, and same thing in the sea, in sea denial and, uh, and and so on. So when when the when the when all these pictures of the destroyed equipment and killed people will be just happening every day, uh, people of Russia will realize that this doesn't make uh, any sense, uh, and uh, they will have problems at home, uh, problems with uh, funding, problems with money, and problems with the political stability. And, and they understand that. We started lots of their lots of their materials. They do understand that, so there is a there is a conscious understanding of that fact inside Russia. We just need to make sure that that happens. Andrew, let me interrupt you and challenge you. You sure. you said you you seem to think that, that the Ukrainian side is is stronger than 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 a lot of perceptions by analysts. If Russia were to use its air force uh, and, and wipe out a couple of cities, sure. uh, I, 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 how 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 would that hold up with your analysis? If they if they well, actually go I mean, in big time. Yeah, of course we'll, we'll look at that. Yes, they can. They can. They can do a lot of damage. They can do a lot of damage to the uh, to the security. To sorry, to the um, uh, the, uh, critical infrastructure and so on, and 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 some cities as well. But uh, the thing is that those actions will not create any support to Putin. Those those actions will make people uh, essentially. And we studied the people's opinions a lot. Uh, people understand that if the war gets to the like or gets real and gets like uh, full scale invasion and so they have nothing to lose, and uh, essentially the majority of them would be participating in whatever way they can. So um, so it's not the question of getting to Ukraine. It's not a question of advancing. It's the question what happens after they formally establish a certain control over the territory, how they actually control it. And uh, how many people they lose, like right next day after they claim they controlled it. But it also depends on what they want. If their goal is to humiliate the West and leave Ukraine uh, so destroyed that it can't join NATO, they don't have to hold a lot, right? Well, that's that's the point because they uh, they want to humiliate the West right now, and they want to uh, psychologically destroy any uh, any any desire to defend and so on. Ukraine has a has an absolutely legal right, and and they wish to defend themselves. Ukraine Ukrainian people, mean majority, as 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 we just discussed, are ready to defend themselves, and uh, they understand that the cost will be will be will be very substantial. But so, what, what do we what do we have to lose? There's no way. We can agree to uh, stop Westernization Ukraine and stop Ukraine moving to a, towards European democracy, which Putin wants. So essentially, the only thing we ask West is not to be weak, because weakness is exactly what reinforces Putin's opinion, uh, Putin's position. Uh, Nothing is going to deter Putin unless he sees that there is no fear. And so, if we don't demonstrate the fear, we ask our partners not to demonstrate the fear. That's what that's that's what that that's the only thing which we which we which we need. Andrew, I think you're making a lot of assumptions in your analysis. When you look at the Levada polling, it, it says that 50 percent of Russians uh, say that NATO and the United States are to blame for for this. And historically, Russians are back their leader. Yeah. But go ahead. Yeah, but so what? I mean, obviously, they through the propaganda, they will be creating quite a lot of. Um, quite a lot of uh, sort of uh, illusions in Russian society. There's no question about that. 
the thing is that uh, uh, the assumptions are based on the fact that we see, for example, even COVID uh, quite substantially decreased the popularity of Putin's regime, which is which is kind of strange because uh, generally speaking, you know, he, they could manage that information wise, but they didn't. And then we have seen previously there was lots of, uh, but again, we're not calculating our uh, our position based on how Russian people react. What we're calculating our position is if Ukrainian people are ready to defend, whatever the scenario is, and the answer is yes. So the only thing which we which we which we need from the West is not to uh, discount us and then not to say that okay. Uh, if Russia starts, Ukraine stop existing, so uh, take it for granted. No, it's not the case. Ukraine will be defending itself very, very actively uh, with lots of losses to Russia. So, you know, unless Putin is completely crazy, uh, he shouldn't start that scenario at all. But I think you have to dive into some of that data. It's true that, that Ukrainians will defend themselves, yeah. but in central in central Ukraine, the areas where Putin may be thinking about going in, the numbers are a lot lower. If If I were Vladimir Putin, I would see that as an opportunity. And what's the point for him to take regions? I mean, what is what is the what is actually strategic advantage of taking one city or one or, or, or one region, uh, and then and then and then uh, and then basically trying to hold it from the rest of Ukraine, trying to get it back, and the world applying all these sanctions which we discussed. So actually, scenarios of actually keeping one city or one small region or one or even a large region. Uh, this is this is a scenario which brings him all all negative parts and all negative kind of consequences and uh, and very few positive. So actually, uh, the, the, how incredible it sounds! But the only way for to 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 have any hopes of holding this, he should take a huge part of the country. Yeah. But then it's a question of how he's going to keep this huge part of the country. We just talked about billions he spends every uh, year on uh, on so called uh, uh, Lugansk and Donetsk republics. Um, how he's going to, where he's going to find people to actually administer all that, uh, how he's going to keep those capabilities. So that's, um, you know, uh, yeah, advancing is not a problem for him. Yes, he can establish air superiority. And by the way, tactical aviation and air defense and, uh, and the Navy are very weak against insurgencies. So, so all these major, uh, major advantages and capabilities, they actually against insurgencies. They are like very uh, weak if, if, if that's applicable at all. So anyway, that's uh, that's uh, yeah, that's where we see. It. I, we we see his losses coming up to unbearable, and um, that's why we believe his main plan, like plan A for sure, is to like you know, it's like in this game, like in a game theory, they use this game of two cars approaching one another, and then each of them hoping that the one will will turn because no one wants to die. So I think that that's that's what he's playing, and uh, he plays that the West will be weaker and start negotiation and Thank conceding. You. Super. Thank you. Thank you so much, General Breedlove. You wanted to jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, we're we're running late. Let me yield back. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Question for you: Why is Germany refusing to allow NATO to sell weapons to Ukraine? And is there any way around Germany's no? Well, I would say, first of all, it is unfortunate that uh, Germany is getting a reputation of uh, restricting support for Ukraine at a time when the West needs to be united and showing that it's standing by Ukraine, helping uh, raise the costs to the Russians, not only through sanctions, where I think the Germans will will come around, I hope, on Nord Stream, uh, but also in terms of military support. Uh, this actual case that's been in the news is, is is maybe not as big a deal as it has been portrayed because it only pertains to some specific weapons that the Ukrainians have been trying to get from the NATO Support and Procurement Agency, NSPA, where there is a requirement for allied consensus. And uh, there were two systems. In the end, the the Germans relented on uh, some anti-drone rifles, which sounds like a pretty useful capability given how the Russians are abusing uh, the use of unmanned vehicles. Uh, they they held their ground in denying some uh, anti-sniper systems, but most by, most of the deliveries to Ukraine are bilateral, and I hope that uh, Ukraine will not be uh, dis- uh, disillusioned here. Uh, it, it can go to specific allies and hopefully get the same capabilities, maybe without the same speed or favorable financing, but uh, but that they can still get them. But Germany needs to think about what kind of signals it's sending to Putin. Uh, this is a policy I think that's carried over from the Merkel government, but of course Schultz was part of that government. Hopefully the Greens, who seem to be more uh, hardline when it comes to supporting Ukraine militarily, will bring about a change in, in, in the policy of the new uh, coalition. I certainly hope so. 
Thanks, Sandy. That's really helpful. Ambassador Herbst, you've been saying something really interesting lately. You've said that the single most important factor to watch regarding how the situation plays out is how Putin view, uh, views Biden. Does Putin respect Biden? Um, I don't know whether or not he respects him. But Putin learned through his cyber provocation that Biden could be challenged, his buttons could be pushed, and he will not necessarily respond. And that's a very dangerous conclusion for Putin to draw. It doesn't mean that conclusion is for all time. But the handling of the crisis on Ukraine's border over the past four or five weeks, unfortunately, contributes to that opinion. Um, Sandy mentioned, for example, the handling of Nord Stream 2. Um, you had Jake Sullivan saying that, well, perhaps if Russia goes into Ukraine, Nord Stream 2 will be used. That perhaps that Vosmorshna in Russian is a disaster. Uh, we need to send very clear signals that we are going to strongly use all of our power, minus necessarily American troops, to make Russia pay a very high price. And we're not doing that right now. And that, that can be changed overnight. But the White House has to realize that if they continue to make concessions, even small ones, to the Kremlin, the Kremlin will not back down. They will continue to threaten in order to gain more concessions. And that's a so very serious problem. Thank you, Ambassador Herbst. We have a number of questions, and I'm going to get to as many as possible. Uh, if you could go ahead and unmute and be ready, uh, I'm going to call on you quickly. Michael Gordon from the Wall Street Journal wants to know, and I'm going to start with General Breedlove. Uh, this is Michael's question. Karen Donfried said yesterday that if Russia invades the U.S., we'll provide military to support to Ukraine above and beyond the current package that is already flowing. Should the U.S. provide that additional military support now? And what specifically should it provide in the limited time that may be a available for the Ukrainians to integrate it in their forces. Uh, sir, the floor is yours. Yes, and we should provide things that they can almost immediately use. And one of those things, as was mentioned before, they do have some capabilities in air defense, but what they don't have is the ability to lash it together to be able to sense, discern, target, and assign weapons. And there's things that we could do almost immediately to help them with that. Could you give them any more specifics? I'm not going to use weapons names. People always want to hang these things on giving them one weapon, which I think is bogus. We okay. need to develop a capability for them, which is a, a series of things that bring them to the ability to employ. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Sandy, Heather, John, Andrew, anyone else want to answer Michael? All good? Andrew? Please. Yes. Uh, dealing with the U.S. help. For, from 2015, I can say that logistics sometimes it takes extremely long time. So uh, planning to do uh, things after the invasion or after the invasion starts, it's almost uh, inevitably gets us in a situation that we'll lose months probably uh, of, uh, of, uh, for, de for delivery. So, so yes, it would make sense to start doing now to in order to create this uh, understanding that the process has started. Uh, the capabilities are increasing, and as uh, we are more ready, so the readiness is increasing, and so readiness is the best deterrent in any way, as we as we say. Uh, so, uh, absolutely, it would make sense to start like as soon as. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sending weapons now would also send a strong signal to Putin that Biden is serious about stopping. It should be done now. Thank you, John. Uh, okay, question from Bill Courtney. Uh, in 2014, the Kremlin seemed to underestimate Ukrainians' will to resist in the Donbass. This is to Andrei Zagorniuk. Do you think the Kremlin might still be doing that? And you're muted, uh, Andrew. Uh, yes, they they may be. Uh, maybe maybe they they constantly underestimated people. They underestimated people in 2004. Uh, during Orange Revolution, they did this in uh, uh, the uh, Euromaidan the Revolution of Dignity, and they did it during the war. Then they realized that, and so they adjusted. So we believe, uh, since they have institutes of like large groups of analysts working in Ukraine every day, I, I think they should understand that, and they should should realize this. What they do underestimate is how weak may, their regular army may be, and that's a risk. Because they do not have an independent, uh, either democratic or, or uh, any other oversight over the armed forces. The armed forces is a closed capsule, which reports directly to, to President uh, Putin, and they don't have any, any independent oversight. Uh, that usually brings a situation to the fact that they overestimating their capabilities because they each level of military reporting 
uh, reporting only good news usually, you know, up upstairs. So uh, usually that's a cold shower. Uh, we They had that in 2014 when they sent troops and uh, had lots of losses. But uh, there is a risk that they may be overestimating their capabilities as we speak. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrew. Sandy, a uh, question from uh, Mr. Gritsenko. It's great to have you with us, uh, Mr. Gritsenko. He says, is it not clear for the Biden administration that, quote unquote, implementing Minsk agreements will kill both current Ukraine and its future? If it is clear, then why is the U.S. leadership repeating that the Minsk mantra even now? I believe to force uh, Ukraine to implement Minsk is the main midterm ob- objective of Putin. What's your response to that? Yeah. And I understand the concern, but I think the Biden administration is trying to square a circle here that's not necessarily easy to square. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is the Minsk framework, I emphasize framework rather than the agreements in some literal sense, is the only uh, basis for negotiations that we have. And there's a risk that if it's if you try to put that to one side and start from scratch, you're going to lose the vehicle that still keeps the, Uni- the European Union united on sanctions. Uh, so I think the administration has to make clear that Minsk is the framework, but that we reject the one-sided interpretation of Minsk that the Russians have been putting forward, and uh, that we're prepared to engage in the negotiations in a much more active way to try to find some way to actually implement the, the intent of Minsk, which is to restore uh, the, the occupied Donbass to true Ukrainian sovereignty, uh, but with some measure of local self-rule in the occupied territories. It may be hard to do that. And Putin, of course, so far has made sure that Russia has blocked any real progress from the very first signature of those Minsk agreements. But if Putin is convinced that it's time to to make a deal, uh, then I think there are ways forward that preserve the framework of Minsk, but avoid some of the traps that the Russians have laid with their one-sided interpretation. Super. Thank you, Sandy. Question to Andrew again. Uh, this is from Robert. He says, "Is the case of uh, in the case of a Russian invasion, how loyal and reliable will the Ukrainian general staff be? How big is the danger of collaboration with Russia inside um, at the senior senior staff level?" Yeah, that 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 is one of the few things which we have uh, very little risk about. To be honest, I mean, to our estimations again, which are very subjective. Right now, most of the uh, most of the uh, senior leadership of general staff and generally military command have been replaced over the last couple of years. And uh, especially since the new commander-in-chief came, uh, General Zaluzhny, and uh, we see uh, some very, very talented uh, leaders there. So uh, I wouldn't look at that as the uh, some, you know, any, 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 any risk or whatsoever. Obviously, people are people. And uh, things happen, but uh, but from just profiling them and understanding who they are, uh, there's some people, there's some some generals with with a, already with a very deep battlefield experience, been to an action physically, you know themselves, and so yeah, so so for for that perspective, I think our uh, Ukraine is is quite strong, very Super. strong actually. Super, thank, thank you. you. Question for John and for General Breedlove. How can Black Sea NATO countries contribute in deterring Russian aggression and diluting the bargaining chips laid by Putin? John, go ahead first. Uh, I think that there's uh, many countries around the Black Sea that understand the need to push back against the Kremlin. Romania, Ukraine, Georgia, to a lesser extent, Bulgaria and Turkey, unfortunately. And increased NATO patrols there, I think, would be a a welcome step. I think that placing maybe some assets, uh, defense assets, um, maybe even missiles in, in Romania, perhaps also in Ukraine, although that, that would require closer closer um, consideration at this point in time, um, would give the Russian Black Sea Fleet um, pause. And uh, other steps can be taken as well. There are, there are under, underwater drones. And actually, actually, I'm talking beyond my, my, my expertise. Phil, there's more your stuff. So there are several things that could be done. And again, it's sort of to the question of speed. The short-term things that could be done is to bring some very sophisticated coastal defense cruise missiles to the area. Literally, you could control the entrance and exits to Sevastopol from the Romanian coastline if you wanted to. And we need to be then, as we establish a more immediate capability, think about how do we, one, increase NATO participation in the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. American participation is pretty good. 
And two, how do we increase the capabilities of those nations? Because their naval capabilities are fairly limited with the exception of Turkey, which uh, tends to keep itself down in the southwest corner of the Black Sea so as not to come into conflict with the Russians. Thank you so much, General Breedlove. Heather, question for you. Expanding are the focus do you have concerns that we could be looking at a two-front war with Russia invading Ukraine and China hitting Taiwan? Or uh, maybe not a two-front war immediately, but that, that China would look uh, and, and say, it's a green light, why not? What do you think about that? So this is why I think uh, how the, the, the West, the Biden administration, or European colleagues uh, address this Russia challenge sends a clear message to all of America's allies, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. And, uh, you know, the questioner rightly uh, points out the increased Sino-Russian uh, alignment. Um, and, of course, uh, we know President Putin at this point is going to attend the Beijing uh, Olympics. Um, for those of you who recall your history in 2008 in Georgia, Olympics and invasions and French presidencies of the EU all hit, hit the same time. I feel like that, that historical moment, but uh, not to, to, to put a lighter touch on it, but the, the Sino-Russian collaboration, exactly what would stretch the U.S. military capabilities the most? Uh, making a choice uh, between having to respond to a challenge uh, on NATO's eastern flank and having to continue to press uh, for ensuring sea lanes of communication are open uh, in the South China Sea and Indo-Pacific and making sure that Taiwan is defended. I, you know, again, I think this is uh, more about how the West is going to address spheres of influence, whether that's in the Indo-Pacific or in Europe. Um, will it do it with unity and with strength and with courage, uh, or will it accommodate accom accommodate until there is a larger crisis? And I think that that really is the key. But continue to look to uh, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin talking a lot more, coordinating things at the United Nations and other places. They are, you know, it's it's a the condominium is growing as an anti-Western uh, approach. So we have to keep this in mind very much as we continue to to strengthen our principles and, and international law. Thank you, Heather. Uh, General Breedlove, a question from Chris. Are the Turkish drones a game changer in countering Putin? Well, let's, let's again not talk about one weapon system <laughs> changing everything. A good drone capability that is wrapped into uh, Ukraine's command and control system so that they can bring to ri bring risk to Russian armored forces and Russian mobile forces invading Ukraine for the third time. Um, that would be a good thing. Fabulous. Thank you. Ambassador Herbst, this is a really interesting question. Is it possible the military buildup is a cover for the actual tactical objective, which could be regime change through internal um, internal subterfuge in Ukraine? If you put enough pressure on Zelensky that he will blink and give special powers to the LNR, DNR, or worse, there's inner, um, inner provocations. Um, is this enough to split Ukrainian society? Could this, this be the, the game, or do you, do you think that it's really about uh, the military? I think that the buildup is designed to produce concessions from either Ukraine, the United States, the Germans, the French, the EU. Uh, and what you've described, I think, might be uh, very high on the Kremlin wish list, but I think it's highly unlikely to happen. Uh, they can produce some small fissures in Ukrainian society or exploit some small fissures in Ukrainian society. But as you know, Melinda, a large majority of Ukrainians are prepared to defend their sovereignty and their territorial integrity, and this game will not go very far. Putin's aggression in Ukraine going back to 2014 has made him the father of current Ukrainian nationalism. Great. Thank you. Uh, and, and, uh, General Breedlove, another question for you. Um, when the Biden administration says no American troops on the ground in Ukraine, does that also include no B-2s or F-35s in the air? Uh, or is that a possibility? Or what is, uh, could you help us parse that? Well, I can't speak for the president about what he means, but uh, uh, factually, no boots on the ground can be accomplished by a lot of air power. So we'll just leave it at that. Okay. Super. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Unfortunately, we are at time. We have to conclude today by thanking uh, our distinguished panel. Thank you so very much. Two of them are on vacation and they agreed to do this anyway. You guys are heroes. I'd like to thank uh, Bernard Henri Levy for his welcoming remarks. And I'd also like to thank the Harvard uh, Center and the Temerty Foundation for making this event possible. Folks, this subject is not going away and we're going to be doing it again on January 6th. We wish you happy holidays and we wish Ukraine peace and prosperity and the American, uh, the United States as well. Happy holidays and see you back in January. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.